I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to the Bunky Clinic Virtual Visiting Professor Series. I have the honor tonight of, of uh, welcoming a very dear friend of ours, uh, Dr. Glenn Gaston. Um, from uh, the Carolinas Medical Center. Dr. Gaston is the Chief of Hand Surgery in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery um, at the Carolinas Medical Center, and um, he is the, one of the main surgeons at Ortho Carolina. Dr. Gaston got his uh, bachelor's degree from the University of Georgia. Um, he then completed his MD at the University of Tennessee in Memphis, followed by uh, orthopedic surgery at the Atlanta Medical Center. And then he uh, completed his hand surgery fellowship at the Indiana Hand Center, which, as we know, is one of the most prestigious fellowships in the country. Dr. Gaston gained national recognition, and we're going to hear about this tonight, for the development and implementation of the so-called starfish procedure. And um, we're, very, we're looking forward to, this, to hearing about the details of this. It's a very innovative new procedure for partial hand amputees. At Ortho Carolina, he started the Ortho Carolina Congenital Hand Clinic. He also started the Brachial Plexus Clinic and the, the Reconstructive Center uh, for Lost Limbs. He's won, won many awards for innovation and also for academic achievements. Uh, he won the JE Hanger Award for innovation in 2020. Um, he won um, uh, what is one of the best papers at the 2016 Hand Society meeting. He was voted as one of the orthopedic surgeons to know in Becker's Orthopedic Review. He also uh, won a, the Faculty Teaching Award three times, so clearly has a lot of dedication not just to advancing the field, but also in, in teaching fellows and residents as well. He won the Ortho Carolina Catalyst Award in 2012 and the Physician of the Year as well in, in 2012. Dr. Gaston is very heavily involved in, in upper extremity research, and as, as I mentioned, he's won uh, numerous awards, and, and these are both from the Orthopedic Academy as well as ASSH. And um, I think uh, equally as interesting, he's a hand consultant for uh, not only the Carolina Panthers, but also the Charlotte Hornets uh, and uh, NASCAR, which is, uh, which is quite cool. Um, Glenn, thank you so much for being with us. It's really an honor to have you. We're lo really looking forward to uh, hearing your uh, talk tonight. Thanks, Bob. I appreciate it. All right, I'm going to make you uh, the presenter now. You should be able to share your desktop with us. All right, you see that OK? Yep, it looks great. Let me try to get some of this other stuff minimized or whatever. Hang on just two seconds. There we go. Do you see that full screen, Bobby? Because mine shows up as not quite. There we go. Yeah, it looks great. All right, perfect. All right. Well, thanks again for having me. It's a real honor. You get This lecture series has been fantastic that you've put together. I've enjoyed listening to a lot of really good talks, and uh, hope you guys will enjoy this one on our, our approach to partial hand amputees. So amputation in general really gets viewed as an ablative loss, and it's usually like we've given up, we failed, we can't save it. But what I hope you'll gain from tonight's lecture is a new perspective and really viewing amputation as a reconstructive opportunity and not simply a failure. So again, amputation to us has really become an opportunity to reconstruct the residual limb. And there's several principles that I want to talk about with partial hands that I think will tee you up for success. You know, it's funny when we think, I always jokingly say, I think it's funny how you can have an FTP laceration to the small finger and we'll do three surgeries, 100 hours of therapy to get somebody back the ability to do like 40 degrees of DIP flexion. But if it comes to amputating half of their hand, it's basically like the intern comes in and does it. You see them once for suture removal and send them off the prosthetist and say, good luck with everything. So. Here's some thoughts of maybe a better approach uh, than what we've traditionally done. Number one, I think you really need to know what are the prosthetic options for partial hands, because there's several of them, and we'll review those tonight. The, the pressing need to create a bony stability and a good soft tissue envelope that can wear a prosthesis, and I'll delve more into that coming up. Really optimizing the, the length of the residual limb, managing the nerves to prevent and or manage neuromas, and then just the overall thought of what should I amputate and what should I preserve? So this category of partial hand amputees is really vast. And you know, if you think about it, none are really the same. They've got varying etiologies, infection, tumor, vasopressor, trauma, they're different levels. We've got MP, PIP, metacarpal level, we've got radial hand, ulnar hand, but they kind of get lumped into partial hand amputees. And I think all of us would look at this and say, that's a pretty big difference of what we've got to work with. So really your approach can't be prescriptive. And so what I'm really gonna try to go over is more guiding principles of how we approach every one of these unique cases to 
to get the optimal opportunity for success for these patients. So what are the prosthetic options that are out there for partial hand amputees? Here's the basic four categories. We've got silicone passive devices, as you see right there on the right. We've got durable metal passive devices that I'll show you. We've got body powered passives, and then we have myoelectric. And all have a role, and it's really choosing which one or ones is the most appropriate for that individual patient. Silicone passive devices, the one thing about them is they're incredibly cosmetic. So this is the same patient with the above and below picture. Uh, one of the big things is if you want to order one of these for your patients, do not dictate in your note that you want a cosmetic device. Even though they are cosmetic, if you dictate it as such, it will be denied almost universally by insurers. So your note needs to say a passive functional silicone prosthesis. If you put that in your note, it'll get approved. And they are functional. If you look at the image on the right, this guy's got a silicone thumb and he's holding a sledgehammer and can work with it. So they, they can be functional as well. The cons are they're not nearly as durable as some of the other ones I'm gonna show you. And they are really costly if they wanna tattoo it and paint it to look like that. So these are some of the metal passive devices. These are called Titan fingers. Uh, these are incredibly durable and we've used them for construction workers. I've got patients that literally do pull-ups with these. Um, so you can see there what they do, they're little ratcheting digits. So the patient has to use their other hand, which is one of the negatives, but they can ratchet it down to hold on to really heavy stuff. And they're re really durable, like I said. The other problem is you have to lock them in one position at a time and you have to keep using your other hand to do so. So here's just a little video showing how, how these can be. So this guy has a passive device. Just kind of click the next one over, Bob, back in the middle, just so you can shoot a ball. And when he finishes that up, he can even pour a cup of water. So very, very functional, very simple, and very durable. Now, these are body-driven prostheses, and a company called Naked Prosthetic makes these. I don't have any affiliation with them. And basically, when you're debating how much length should you save, if you can put a ring on it, you can put one of these on it. And so the nice thing about these is they come in MP drivers and PIP drivers. So for instance, the one at the top has four digits lost just proximal to the PIP joint, but they can use the MP motion they have to result in closing of individual fingers uh, at the PIP and DIP level. And if they've got a PIP level amputation or like mid P2, as you see in the lower left image, then it just does the DIP joint for them. And then the thumb is the one you saw on the right in the little video bouncing the ball. And then there's myoelectrics. Uh, the nice thing about myoelectrics is you don't have to use your other hand to work them. And the problem is though, you're limited by the number of surface EMG signals that you can pick up. Basically, you can pick up the first DI and the abductor digiti quinti, but all of the central interossei are too deep to detect. So you're relying just on those two muscles to run everything. Therefore, digital control, which is composite grasp and release, is very non-intuitive. So patients have to think like abduct their fingers to open them all up, and they have to think squeeze their fingers together to close the hand. So it's a very non-intuitive option. So once we understand what the different prosthetic options are, we've got to make a hand for these patients that can then bear the prosthesis. And there's two real keys to this. I think most of us understand what needs to be done from a bony perspective. We need to fix fractures. We need to arthrodese joints at times to get a stable bony construct. But this is one I want to spend a second on is really the soft tissues. That tends to be the limiting factor. Uh, I was taught when I was in training that, you know, maintain length and just cover it with whatever you could. Groin flaps, radial forearm flaps. And while these provide reliable coverage, they absolutely ruin prosthetic options because they're so bulbous. So we've really evolved our thinking and we try to make our soft tissue coverage absolutely as thin as possible for these. So the majority of ours we're managing with like split thickness skin grafts, Integra, the picture you saw on the slide before, this is his thumb. So we've done multiple debridements, primarily closed the owner side, we've replanted the thumb and we've handled the soft tissue defect just with Integra and a skin graft. And if we need something more, something like a random uh, chest wall pattern flap, because you can see the guy below has had a radial forearm flap for his index and a groin flap for his thumb. And now we've got these two absolute massive digits that are, ab that are unusable and there's no prosthetic options we can give this guy. And you can debulk these over and over and over and you're years into the process uh, just to get it down to something that's even manageable. So thin as possible, 
Um, and we don't really, I have not had trouble with split thickness skin grafts with prostheses on them for partial hands. What about the role of transposition for central digital loss? This is a topic that comes up a bunch um, and we use it uh, quite frequently. So I think when you have long and ring finger ray amputations, transposition is nice to close that defect. There's two different ways to do it. There's soft tissue transpositions, which are nice because you're not relying on bony healing. One of the problems is they can stretch out over time. The classic teaching is the transverse centimeter carpal ligament, take it off of the two adjacent fingers and sew that together. You can augment that as in this patient with a tight rope. Another nice option for the ring finger, uh, if you remember the index long and small fingers all have extrinsic uh, flexors attached to them, extrinsic wrist flexors attached to them, but the ring finger does not. So you can actually remove the entire ring finger ray all the way down to the metacarpal base. And then you can take the fifth ray and transpose it into the fourth ray spot within the hamate and then just pin that for about four weeks. So that's a nice way to close down the defect and perform a transposition for the ring finger. For the long finger, you can't do that trick. And so if you've got a patient with a better opportunity for bony healing, I like a bony transposition. So index to long finger, bony transpositions, my preference for the long ring finger. Uh, again, I'll just scoot the index metacarpal over into its spot. I like an IM screw for this now. It really minimizes the amount of um, soft tissue dissection you have to perform to do it. And the cons, again, would of course be a non-union, but that, that actually has been fairly rare in my practice. Optimizing length. So for the fingers, pressure-induced necrosis for partial hands is one of the most common causes we see. The biggest pearl I can tell you on these is just wait, wait, wait. We wait many, many months before we do the amputations unless we're facing like a, a wet gangrene situation because you really want to allow time for these to demarcate. If you see those arrows, that's where when the, first, the patient first presented uh, the SCAR was two. And if you see just waiting a few months, look at the additional length that was saved as it kind of unmasks itself when some of that deeper tissue heals and you don't have to shorten these quite as much. And you can see she ends up with a pretty functional result for a hand that at the very beginning we thought was going to end up being all five digits loss and potential below elbow type amputations. So here's another case that's a good one. Even certain times you just think saving that link's not gonna be useful. This guy, all we could say was like PIP level of his small finger, nothing else. Look how much motion he ends up getting out of just his small finger. And look at, look beside it too. So that's all a split thickness skin graft within there. So we have very slim soft tissues. We can fit something on it. Now the video beside that, if you play it to the left, you'll see what we could do taking just that small finger and adding just a simple opposition post. So this is a ratcheting, this is that Titan finger, that um, passive metal device I was talking about. So he can manipulate it where he needs to and use just that small finger to be really functional. And you can see the various positions he can put this in to be able to utilize it. And that's been a really useful thing for us. So even cases you don't think you're saving much, if you can save one digit, keep that initially. You can always revise it to more proximal, cover it with the thinnest possible coverage that you can. On top plasty, uh, doesn't get a lot of discussion, but we found it really useful for some of these partial hands. This is a girl uh, that was a four extremity loss, and you can see we did an on top plasty for left index finger. We transposed that on top of the thumb to deepen that web space to make a more functional left hand. On the right hand, you can see we ended up doing a three finger starfish procedure and then revision amps of the thumb and index with a subsequent web deepening. And you can see how much this gave her on the next slide. So here she is in the OR. So that's, we've amputated the index. We've on top plastic it onto the thumb. We've left those two digits there. And now you'll see a little video of how she can work on the next slide. And so here she is now, so she can go digit to digit. Uh, this is her just two months out. So as you can see, she's barely even healed her soft tissues, but now she's got good grasp. She can pinch with this. She actually puts on both of her uh, below knee amputation prostheses using that. Another technique is distraction lengthening. Uh, this is a kid with amniotic band syndrome. You can see in the upper left image how short his thumb was. And just with a single distraction, we gained almost an inch of length. And now he can oppose to every one of his digits. The obvious cons with this are a high rate of complications, particularly pin tract infection. And if that regenerate bone's not strong enough, the potential for refracture or the need to bone graft it. What about the nerves and how do we handle them? I'll be honest with you, most partial hands, we still just do traction erectomy. Uh, there are symptomatic neuromas in about 10 to 20% if you read the literature and uh, overall, 
When we do bigger partial hands like our starfish, we like the end-to-end -end or centrocentral coaptation, as you see in the upper right. And then for revision cases, if they've got a symptomatic neuroma and how to manage it, uh, the allograft road to nowhere, I personally don't use and don't have experience with, but it's been reported. And then the use of TMR within the palm, which I'll show you, and the use of RPNI. And really, none of these methods have proven to be any more superior than the other. So here's an example of palm TMR. This is our tech preferred technique for symptomatic neuromas. You can see this patient had a thumb amputation with a very symptomatic um, ulnar digital nerve neuroma. And we've excised the neuroma and then through a very small proximal incision, you can uh, TMR that directly into uh, really any of the intrinsics of your choice. In this case, we chose the first lumbrical. One pearl I'll tell you, if you're gonna use the lumbrical for this, go ahead and take the lumbrical off of the FDP. Otherwise, as they open and close their finger, uh, the traction that it puts on that nerve can be symptomatic for several months before it finally calms down. So if you release the lumbrical and just leave it as a free innervated muscle, it does better than allowing it to uh, have its typical excursion with the FTP. So here's an example. This is a 35-year-old police officer. She had her thumb bit off by a dog and she had healed and she couldn't wear a prosthesis because it put pressure right there. And the other problem was she couldn't use her gun. The recoil kept giving her pain in that area. So if you go to the next slide, we'll see the video of her intra-op and then how she ends up doing. And this is us testing first lumbrical. You can see the MP flexion IP extension. And then it's just like any other targeted muscle reinnervation. We're going to cut the innervation to the lumbrical and we're going to transfer that uh, nerve that was containing the neuroma, in this case, the owner digital, directly into that. And then three months later, if you click the uh, advancement button, you'll see that she passed her shooting test and she's able to return to full duty as a police officer. So those are our current kind of options. And one thing a couple of years ago, my partner Brian Lawler and I just were underwhelmed by what we could really do and really thought to ourselves, what can we do to really overcome those challenges and improve some of the functional control for these partial hand amputees? So this was the case that really uh, changed things for us. This was a 39 year old man, industrial accident, got his hand caught in an auger. And you can see we've got uh, partial thumb amputation and a three finger avulsion. We did try to replant it, but you can look at that and predict, of course, my replants don't live nearly as much as uh, the Bunky clinics to begin with, but this one, no surprise to me, went on to uh, not survive. And uh, I'll show you how we decided to manage that next. So the problem with these partial hand amputees when you wanna do myoelectrics, like I said, is that we need surface electrodes to detect the signal. So we've only got the first dual center osseous and the abductor digiti quinti because those central intrinsics are too deep to detect. And if you want to use the forearm flexors, you can, but now you're binding up their wrist because you have to span all that with it. So it's not very functional either. So we had the idea of what if we transferred the existing inner osseae that are still there in some of these patients? Because if you think about it, the vulvar and dorsal inner osseae are still innervated. They're still in the palm. They're just too deep to detect. So why not do a simple muscle transfer, place them in a subcutaneous position on the dorsum of the hand, whereby then the surface electrodes could detect them. So the question was, can we do it without compromising their innervation or their, their uh, viability? And this is actually the cocktail napkin that we sketched it out on originally in the surgeon's lounge, coming up with the idea uh, three years ago. So this is what we came to. We did a cadaveric study first to see, could we move them? Number one, could we even find the pedicle? I had no idea where the pedicle was to the inner osseae. So could we find it? And then if so, could we transfer it? Would it survive? And if it did survive, would the signal it produced be strong enough to even be detected by surface electrodes? And if it was, would it be intuitive and distinct enough to work? And then if so, could we create a prosthesis that could actually drive it? So this is kind of the concept, axially speaking. So what we're going to do in this patient, remember this guy still had his index finger, so we need long ring and small finger. So we thought, what if we move the dorsal inner osseae to the subcutaneous location, the small finger would still be driven by the abductor digiti quinti. So one key thing you'll notice is we leave the volar inner osseus, and that's important because if you take any web space, take for instance your second web space, remember what resides there is your first volar inner osseus and your second dorsal inner osseus. But your first volar inner osseus controls your index finger. It's your, it adducts your index finger, flexes the MP, and extends the IP, whereas your second dorsal inner osseus in the same space controls your middle finger. 
So if you moved them both at the same time, you'd have one signal for index finger and one fiddle, one signal for middle finger, which would be confusing. So you just want to move the one for that individual digit that you're looking for. And then that would then allow the signal to be detected by the surface electrodes. And then basically, if you think of it, each finger is now its own prosthesis housed within one shell. So this is what that looks like. So here's our exposure. This is a different patient, but you can see they've got a partial index finger. So the exposure, we're going to raise a full thickness flap. We're going to take the extrinsic extensor tendons, as you see here, and reflect those. And we'll begin to see the inner ossei beneath. And now we're going to raise the dorsal inner ossei subperiosteally off of the metacarpal. So you can see there's the second, here's the third subperiosteally elevated, and then we're going to see the fourth subperiosteally elevated right beside that. All right. And those are the extrinsic extensors back there. And there's a little vascular pedicle. These are supplied predominantly palmarly, but the dorsal metacarpal arch has an extension. Uh, to each digit coming right across the metaphyseal flare. So we'll find that and keep that as well. Then we'll do our metacarpal resections, which we'll see in the next video. And here's what that looks like. Basically what we want to do is resect three centimeters of metacarpal from each metacarpal. And the reason for that is that allows sufficient room for the prosthetic fingers. So if you left the metacarpal heads, the fingers would be too long uh, and so that's the reason we were sucked back. And three centimeters is something we figured out just in conversation with our uh, with our prosthetist. So here we are removing the metacarpal heads and we've left behind the subperiosteally elevated inner ossei, dorsal inner ossei. And now this is that key step I was talking about. So now this plane, I didn't know how to found it originally, but if you look forward, it's pretty easy. You'll see that the volar and dorsal inner ossei muscle bellies, um, the muscles running at different orientations. So you can find the plane right between them and you can separate the volar and dorsal inner ossei as you see going on here. And then once you've got that separation, again, we'll leave the volar inner osseus behind and we'll transfer that, that dorsal inner osseus uh, to the dorsal aspect of the metacarpal. And here's what that looks like. So now the metacarpals have been removed. Here's the dorsal inner osseus. You see we can mobilize that. And in this case, we're going to take the, the second dorsal inner osseus to the long finger, and we're going to put that dorsal on the dorsal aspect of the third metacarpal. And we're going to take the fourth meta, the fourth dorsal inner osseus more ulnarly, which was controlling our ring finger, and we're going to swing that dorsal over the fourth metacarpal to control the ring finger. And again, this is us just planning those transfers, showing where they're going to sit in their locate respective locations. And then what we're going to do once we've laid them in, we want to prevent what's called crosstalk. So one problem if you have two muscles sitting right next to each other is the signal can be confusing as to which muscle is trying to talk to that uh, surface electrode. So we'll take the extrinsic extensor tendons and we'll sew those to the volar plate or flexor sheath in between to create a barrier to really separate those two myocytes so that we can get distinct signals. And you can see that on the slide below as well. And then here's kind of our final results. So now we've just rearranged the skin and closed them up. So this is my hand. I know it's upside down, but there's surface electrodes. And you see the hand in the background. And what it's showing is that when you put the surface electrodes over my hand and I try to make a fist, nothing happens because it's too deep. The signals are too deep. And this is showing the patient we just did on the right, that even at two weeks post-op, as soon as you put the electrodes on and ask them to make a fist, you'll see the prosthetic hand closes. So because it's a pedicled muscle transfer, it works immediately. So post-op day zero, these will actually already work. And it takes no retraining because if you think about what the dual center I do, they're MP flexors. So all the patient thinks is flex my middle finger and it's going to work. So this is our patient the very first time we've ever asked him to try this. And we're going to ask him to move his middle finger and you'll see the middle finger go. And now we're going to ask him to do a small finger and you'll see the small finger go. And now we're going to ask him to do all three at the exact same time, and he can do them all. So this is the first time he's ever tried it with absolutely zero training just sitting in the office. That's kind of how we felt after watching it for the first time. I was right there with Farley. Really great. So this is the first trial prosthesis we ever made him. We're going to ask the patient, you'll see him begin to get control of individual fingers as he can flex and roll each one at a time. Here's his middle finger. And here's after a little bit. So now this guy's a few months in. You can see he's starting to really get the hang of it, rolling 
using his fingers. And that we learned a couple of things with this. One thing we learned is that the interossei aren't made to carry that much load. So if patients wanted to sustain a grip, like if they were going to carry something for long periods of time, one thing we recognize is what would happen is they would fatigue and then the digits would open up unwanted. So we added something uh, that we call a grip lock function. So you can ask patients to double clutch or make a fist twice, and then all the digits will close and lock in that position. So if they're gonna do manual labor or use it for prolonged periods of time, it's a nice way to do it. In the very beginning too, you can adjust the threshold. So if some patient's having a hard time getting one of the signals to generate, you can just decrease the amount of signal that has to be detected by that surface electrode to produce the contraction for that particular digit. So in the very beginning, there's some adjustments for the threshold and then the grip lock feature was a big one. And so here's the guy now, you can see he's got really fluid individual digital control. He can pick up a 20 pound dumbbell, he can open a car door. There's something about uh, every patient we have loves to use a weed eater, you can shovel. So here he is and he's become really functional. He's back uh, basically fully back to just about everything he could do beforehand. So, so far now, we've done 20 of these. Uh, all of them have been able to demonstrate independent EMG signals to control uh, individual fingers on their myoelectric prosthesis. And a lot of guys uh, and ladies have enjoyed uh, certain gestures. You can see this guy likes to drop the hang 10. And then, uh, of course, the independent middle finger extension is a perennial favorite amongst uh, virtually all of the patients so far. So what about expanding it further? Um, I'm going to introduce you to the concept. We've done two of these now that we call our pedicled starfish. And starfish, as you know, are famous for their ability to regenerate lost limbs, which is what the, uh, the origin of the name came from. And the fact that when you pedicle all of the interossei and look at it, as you see on the left, it looks like a starfish itself. So this was a case of a 39-year-old lady who was a year out from this partial hand, radial-sided hand amputation. She actually basically was a full hand amp, but the rest got replanted. But a year later, she's insensate in those three digits and incredibly stiff. She's already undergone one extensor tenolysis and capsulectomies, and she's got about 10 degrees of total passive motion. And she basically comes in and just requests a forearm level amputation. And so this is what we did for her. We call this our pedicled starfish. So we kept the radial and ulnar arteries, the superficial and deep arch, the median and ulnar nerves with their contributions to each one of the intrinsics. So you can see labeled there is basically one intrinsic muscle for each digit. And we're gonna keep that on its neurovascular pedicle and we're gonna remove the rest of the hand and forearm to convert her to a below elbow amputation but preserving individual finger capability. And then we're gonna pedicle that more proximally and put it back in. For the sensory nerves, we added TMR for that. So we kept pronator quadratus and pedicled that, and we put the sensory nerves pedicled uh, into the TMR, into the PQ, and then kept each one of the intrinsics again with its innervation and reflected that. Click advance and you'll see her kind of closed up afterwards. So we're still trying to build her a prosthesis because nothing's ever been made that does that. But on a virtual reality setting, she can actually now control thumb and every single individual digital function as a below elbow amputee. So a few philosophical changes that have come to us ever since we started doing this. One is when I was in training, it was always taught, say you had a five finger amputee, it was always taught, obviously thumb is the number one priority. And then number two is if you put another digit on, put it more ulnar so there was more space between the thumb and that digit for pinch. Uh, because of starfish, this has really changed our philosophy. See, we actually really firmly now think you're better off doing thumb and then next do your index finger because that gives them immediate pinch, fine motor skill with that, and you can always starfish the owner three digits because if you have a situation like the one you see here, putting digits in between those gets in the way of the thumb in that digit. And while a hand like this is very functional from the standpoint of they can pick up little things and like box and block tests, if you give them anything more than about a pound, they can't hold it. And so if you give them a thumb and index, they can do fine motor skills very well. And then you can do uh, prosthetics for the owner three digits to give them more power grasp. And so here's an example of that. You can see this patient was a four finger amputee. So we select, and all, actually none of the digits we did, we think were gonna be salvageable. If the index was able to be salvaged, you can see even with fusions of the MP and PIP joint, the index now, is a sensate post for the thumb to work off of. So he does all of his little fine motor skills with the thumb and index. He can write, he can pick up a quarter or a pen off the ground, and then he can use the uh, myoelectric control 
to hold heavy objects. So he can even do stuff like put grocery bags and hold it with the three uh, myoelectric digits while using a key to open the door. So some other futuristic kind of options. One really fascinating uh, thing is the opportunity for Sensate prosthetics. And we've been uh, working on this with Dustin Tyler out of Case Western. We've got a DARPA grant and a pending NIH grant with implantable nerve cuffs to provide the sensation and implantable myoelectrics uh, to provide the motor control. And currently the leads actually come out of patient's shoulder as you can see here. So this guy can actually plug into his prosthetic and he can feel every finger on his prosthetic mapped down to about a five millimeter spot. And the next generation, which will start uh, in Q, well, it was put with Corona, it's changed. It was supposed to be Q3 of this year. It'll probably be Q4. We're going to have a Bluetooth version of this. We can put Bluetooth nerve cuffs around the nerves. That can Bluetooth straight to the prosthetic, and they can have sensate prostheses. So that's already a reality for uh, major limb amputees, and likely that'll be adapted to partial hand amputees down the road. And just to give you an idea how much this means, this is him seven years. Now, he is a below radial, but this is seven years later, the first time he's felt his wife's hand. And I think you can see just what an emotional impact it has. So the, the ability to get back touch will be a revolutionary change for the prosthetic world. Another big thing we found is the value of having a dedicated clinic for these patients. These don't just come to my office. As, as you mentioned earlier, we have a reconstructive center for lost limbs that's twice a month now. And letting patients talk to each other and learn from each other has been huge. The image on the left is one of my favorite. The guy on the left is the first patient that ever got a starfish. And the guy on the right that he's talking to is the second patient that ever got a starfish. And that's the first guy that ever got one counseling the second guy about what it's like, what it's like to live with it. And then on the right, you see the first ever child that received a starfish prosthesis being counseled by one of our veteran starfish patients. So in the end, I mean, I think really right now, the sky's the limit. Um, I think it's probably the most exciting time to be a part of this field. Uh, amputees, TMR, RPNI, partial hands. It's so fun right now and innovative uh, to, to take care of these patients. As I mentioned earlier, I think you really need to know what are your prosthetic options and then tailor those to the individual patient. We want to maximize bony length initially, basically almost at all cost. Coverage, again, make it as thin as possible. Don't focus so much on durability. You can always take down a skin graft and flap it later if they're having recurrent problems, but we haven't seen that really be the case. And then just be aware of what future options are and don't burn bridges. So someone that's got, you know, has lost all five digits, but he has, uh, he or she has remaining intrinsic muscles, maybe a candidate for a starfish to get individual finger control while maintaining wrist motion as opposed to just converting them to a below elbow. And then the possibility of future sensory transfers, so don't resect those too far proximal, leave yourself an option as well. So uh, we like to say, come on over and give this stuff a try because uh, we found uh, it seems to work okay in our hands. So thanks again, Bob, Beck, for the opportunity to talk. And uh, it's a real pleasure. Brian Loeffler and I, we do all these cases as a two physician team. Uh, he's a very close dear friend of mine. And it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure to learn from these patients. And I'll tell you, Taking care of these patients, this is my favorite day of the month is when these patients are here and taking care of them. They're some of the most grateful patients that oftentimes have been abandoned prior to you getting a hold of them. So a great opportunity. So thanks again. Glenn, thank you so much. Uh, th this was actually, I would say, one of the most interesting talks we've had. Um, we, uh, you know, obviously we have many, many patients uh, whose injuries are severe enough that we just can't save their parts. Um, and so there are plenty of partial hand amputees um, and, you know, not tell the starfish procedure. I think this is definitely some uh, one place that we can all uh, learn from, because I think from a functional standpoint, what you've clearly shown is that um, that individual level of finger control is something that you just can't really get easily with a lot of other techniques out there. Um, I have a, a few questions for you. Um, one of them was on the starfish procedure that you showed with uh, where you actually went to the below elbow level uh, mm -hmm. amputation. That is, um, that's a dissection that none of us are really familiar with, right? Because it's not something you usually do. I get the get the ulnar and radial artery and the and get you know pedicle essentially the all the inner ossei on that and bring approximately. Um, and clearly you showed a cadaver dissection there. How many cadavers did you have to do before you kind of felt comfortable with um, doing that pedicle dissection of the intraosseae? 
we actually so we we really only did one um and the trickiest part is removing the thumb because the way the uh, radial artery goes around it so disarticulating the thumb without bagging the radial artery on uh, one of the two sides is the trickiest step in it um and the first one we did took about six and a half hours to do when that's with two of us truly working furiously and the second time around it took about yeah. four hours so we've only done two so far and then one on a cadaver but you know it's it is a tricky dissection but it's also one that any one of us is capable of doing yeah no i think uh it's um it's a very creative solution uh, definitely something that i wouldn't have thought of so congratulations on coming up with such a unique kind of approach to this um we've had um uh, definitely a talk on RPNI. Paul Siderna gave a talk on that, and we've had a couple of folks talk about uh, TMR as well. So clearly, there are options that folks are talking about in, in trying to maximize patient's function using prosthetic control. Um, my question for you, as someone who clearly is very familiar with TMR and RPNI as well, um, what are your thoughts on TMR versus RPNI? I know it's a different topic than we're talking about right now. Um, uh, we'll start with that, and then I'll ask a follow-up question. What are your thoughts regarding um, RPNI versus a, a TMR type procedure. Yeah, I think so. I think both have a major role and both should be in your armamentarium if you're going to do uh, these types of procedures. Uh, the advantage right now of TMR for us is the ability to restore function that otherwise is gone. So if you take an above elbow amputee, as you know, if you do TMR and put median into biceps, now you've got grasp and you still have elbow flexion from the other head of biceps. If you add PIN into lateral head of triceps, now you've brought that back. RPNI, Paul can do that in his lab, but that's only because he has IMEs. So IMEs right. are implantable myoelectric electrodes that can then send the signal to the prosthesis. So RPNI works for improving motor if you have IMEs, but surface electrodes can't detect uh, RPNI. So we use TMR and we're trying to either for the biggest of the nerves and we use it for when we're trying to bring a function that downstream has been lost. But like in baloney amputees, we'll usually do TMR for like tibial and perineal, but then we'll do RPNI for all the sensory nerves because we don't want to denervate and atrophy what's left of that limb. So we use RPNI more often for sensory nerves in our practice, and generally speaking, and TMR more often for mixed motor sensory nerves. Got it. Um, that makes sense. The uh, so the the prosthetics that you showed obviously they have. Um, Really incredible control with just surface uh, surface electrodes, which, as you mentioned, is is that you don't see with other te techniques necessarily. Um, what is your your patient's um, kind of uh, level of um, basically how are they wearing these prosthetics pretty regularly? What we've seen with other prosthetics is that they kind of start out wearing them and then eventually they um, kind of don't wear them as much and so on and so forth. These seem to be functionally much more advanced so do you find that the patients um are more consistently than others and, and how long is kind of the battery life and so on yeah both good questions so actually one of our fellows casey sabag who's on the call i can see your name down there uh is just finishing up looking up our uh, our starfish series so far of those 20 and what's been amazing to me is if you look at the utilization it's like eight to 12 hours per patient uh, the battery life initially was a big problem, um, but now they've got the second generation lithium batteries that they're using for them that are giving them uh, that much length. So they're making it pretty much through the day with it, and most of them really are putting them on in the morning and then take them off and they go to bed and using them all day. Wow, that's that's pretty amazing. And I think the insight that you had with regards to the the locking mechanism uh, is key because clearly, you know, um, beyond fine touch and and tip pinch and everything, I think grip obviously is very important. So that was a key advancement there um <clears throat> the any um kind of thoughts on on the price of some of these prosthetics we we have um most of our videos are viewed online afterwards by hundreds and hundreds of people and many of them are overseas and so we constantly get asked about the the price of some of these prosthetics because some of these patients are not in, in systems where there are third-party payers um, any yeah. kind of comments on that and, and, and how potentially available these could be to patients who are not in a third-party system type uh, atmosphere? Yeah, so I think it obviously, when you look at those different options I put down there in the beginning, some of those basic things are majorly beneficial, like that simple opposition post that I showed for a thumb or a small finger. And I mean, you can get a single digit opposition post for next to nothing. I mean, those are probably under 100 bucks for the most basic version of that. 
uh, when you get to some of those ratcheting fingers, you're now um, moving up into, you know, a few thousand dollars probably. And when you get to the, the starfish hand, right now, every one of those we're having to make individually in the kind of piecemeal it in parts. The, the total cost of the processor and all the parts is about 25 grand for the starfish hand. And that's without labor. That's actually not as uh, expensive as, as I thought. It, it's, I thought it would be a lot more than that, but uh, so that's that's good. Yeah. Um, now the um, I think one of the advantages is um, you know as opposed to a TMR where you the patient does have to um, go through some learning or there has there has to be a lot of software involved to be able to learn you know this part of the PEC is now you know grip strength or or wrist flexion for example this part is wrist extension and so on it seems like this is much more intuitive because you're basically using the muscles that used to go to those fingers anyway um, I noticed that in the below elbow amp, you had a couple of staples in the skin um, uh, yeah, that were not part of the closure. Right. Are you essentially marking um, kind of where some of those muscles are just for surface um, a diagram, if you will? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. that's exactly what it is. So when we do pedicled starfish, we've put staples over exactly where each one of those muscles is to be able to find it when we go back uh, to help the prosthetist map out where each one of those is. Um, because a few times it's not as intuitive where they would be. Some of them end up closer together and some wider, just mm -hmm. depending on which intrinsic you use and how it reflects. Um, so that's exactly what those were for, those additional staples. Yeah, and you're right. One beauty of starfish is it's perfectly intuitive because every one of those muscles is doing exactly what it did before. So there's no retraining. And it's just a single service electrode over top of each muscle. As you mentioned in TMR, most often people are using a pattern recognition system. So you've got many yep. more leads with a much more um, robust processor to interpret all that. So that really drives up the cost. Yeah, I think that's the one of the biggest parts of that because, uh, you know, we, we've seen some great talks by, you know, Greg Damanian and and, um, and Ian Valerio and, and folks doing TMR and, and some of the results are, are great, but it doesn't seem like it does involve a lot of pattern recognition um, kind of post procedure that you know is necessary. Obviously, these are much more proximal amputations, but this does seem much more intuitive, which is uh, which is great. I I know that I definitely want to this um, you know next opportunity I I have because you know we uh, we don't have a dedicated. Um, Kind of a limb loss type clinic, but but there are definitely a fair number of them sprinkled about in each clinic. <laughs> so I think, yeah, so I think I'll be hitting you up for some pointers next time I I have a a, a case that I think this would be a benefit for. It'd be great. Now, be are great. you working with Hanger Orthopedics as far as the uh, prosthetic specialists, or who who are you working with? Yeah, that's who kind of we use whatever prosthetist. Some patients come with a prosthetist, so we've used probably a dozen different companies overall, but Hanger's the company we've done the most with, and they are the company that devised the Starfish Hand originally. We're working now, one problem we've had is the Starfish Hand as it stands is like this company's fingers and that company's processor and putting them together. The one thing we ran into is each one saying, we're not gonna cover any warranties or anything that goes wrong because you're not, you're mixing and matching different companies' parts. So we are currently working with uh, a different company right now to make a commercially available Starfish Hand where if you did one, you could just order it and it comes in one package. So you can wow. just use it. Right now we're having to hand make it with various parts that we can do. I see. Well, that's good to know. We do have some really good prosthetics uh, prosthetic specialists who are here at UCSF right next door to us. But uh, it's good to know that, that uh, coming soon is, is basically kind of a uh, a kit, if you will, uh, for the starfish yeah. hand. Down the road. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, Glenn, thank you so much for for a really interesting talk. I'm I'm very excited to have this as part of our series because I think it's something that that a lot of us. Um, first of all, I think very few people know how to do because obviously this is fairly recent, and you guys are the ones who did the groundbreaking work on it. But I think it's really um, a technique that I think most hand replantations should be able to do. Um, so yeah. I think it's going to affect a, a lot of patients' lives. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's it's not that technically demanding. It's really not. Um, anybody that was heading in to do a replant can very easily just pedicle a muscle uh, to maintain length. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Thanks so much, and congratulations, really, on on the work and 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 coming up with that with this novel idea. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Great. Um, well, it was uh, great having you. I, I look forward to seeing you in person soon. Unfortunately, it won't be at ASSH, but uh, right. hopefully not not too long from now. 
Likewise. Take care, man. Great. Thanks, Glenn. Have a great night. You too. Bye.